welcome to this session and uh, we are going to talk about the emerging resistance to the out of india theory and we have uh, uh, dr conrad elst with us who has done seminal work in refuting first the aryan invasion theory and uh, then also on the out of india theory welcome dr elst how are you and uh, what is this uh, out of india theory first of all if you could explain and then uh, tell our viewers uh, why there is so much resistance to it emerging now right well let me say first of all that we are uh, taping this on the day of the pentecost which you know is a church holiday but the interesting thing about it is that it celebrates the holy ghost so we're going to be a bit holy today. And um, yeah, it's the, uh, the agent of speaking in tongues when the apostles managed to communicate with the whole audience, regardless of what their language was. So, in fact, it's the, uh, the festival of linguistics also, and therefore of the um, Indo-European language family. And so that's what we're going to talk about. Okay, so when did this uh, this whole uh, debate start? So after a few European travelers to India had noticed some correspondence between the uh, coastal languages of Western India and their own English or Italian or Dutch uh, language. <coughs> It is the French Jesuit Gaston Laurent Cardou who systematized these impressions and uh, thought of the idea of an East European language family. This was in 1767 when he sent a paper to this effect uh, to the French Academy. And uh, it took a few years until uh, it was uh, William Jones who made this public in a famous speech in Kolkata in uh, 1780. So in the beginning, the general assumption was, given the enormous role of Sanskrit in this discovery, and the fact that clearly Sanskrit was an older form of this language than Latin or Greek, for instance, it had preserved eight cases of the noun instead of six in Latin. It had preserved the dual next to the singular and the plural, of which only a few remnants remain in, in uh, Latin, Greek, Germanic, and so on. So given that Sanskrit was clearly older, it was assumed that Sanskrit was the original Proto-Indo-European, or at least close to it, and that then Logically, they thought India should be considered the homeland. And so everybody uh, who speaks in the European came, or at least a very um, linguistically influential part of his ancestry came from India. So this is uh, most uh, explicit in Friedrich Schlegel's book, uh, language and Wisdom of the Indians, 1808. But the, the general climate was very Indo-centric in Europe at the time. So it, this, this idea of an Indo-European language family had nothing to do with an anti-Indian conspiracy as many Indians these days think. <clears throat> now, it is the brother of Friedrich Schlegel who tips the scales against India. You see, after 1800, here and there, there was a paper proposing that maybe the homeland was not India. And so it is his um, proposal to situate the homeland in the Caucasus Mountains or just north of it that really uh, put the uh, Indocentric or the out of India theory on the defensive. Still, the out of India theory, which is the original theory, 
uh, was still being defended, uh, for instance, by the French Veda translator Alexandre Langlois, or by the former governor of Bombay for the East India Company, who later in life turned a historian, namely Mount Stuart Elphinstone in 1841, or even as late as uh, 1856 by a British scholar Curzon, not to be confused with the uh, viceroy of the same name. Uh, so the uh, out of India theory held out fairly long. Um, it's uh, the nail in its coffin probably was the um, discovery or the development of a thing called linguistic paleontology by the French scholar Adolphe Pictet, uh, who proposed that you can find the location of the original speakers of a language by looking at the vocabulary of their language. You see, um, most African languages will have a word for a giraffe. And most European languages don't, or they had to import the word. So you can see that the European languages originated elsewhere than in Africa. So here, applying it to, to the case of Indo-European, Pictet proposed, for example, that the word beach in Latin fagus exists only in the westernmost languages. And therefore, he thought that the homeland must be in Europe, even in Western Europe. More decisive, you see, about the uh, longitude, there could still be a dispute. Some would say it is more easterly more in Poland, more in Russia, but at any rate in a region of cold climate, because he found words for bear, for wolf, and not for tiger, for example. And so that really um, convinced many people, yes, it has to be somewhere more northerly, not in India. And so if Sanskrit was effectively spoken in India, it had to be because the speakers of the language had invaded India. So in the intervening uh, years between about 1850 and 1990, there was hardly any argument against the Aryan invasion theory. That was simply accepted. Actually, there are a few not to say arguments, but at any rate, there are people who take a position against the Aryan invasion theory, notably Sri Aurobindo and uh, Dr. Bhimrao um, Ambedkar. There is also, I found a, a text by a Telugu scholar whose name I forget. Uh, but so he argues against the Aryan invasion theory, fills a whole book with it, brings in Panini and, and the Nirukta and so on, all the ancient the Sanskrit grammarians. And so he tries to use them against the Aryan invasion theory, but ultimately his entire argumentation boils down to the fact that the word Arya in Sanskrit never indicates a race nor even a language. And uh, so that is something that is not really controversial. After 1945, when race thinking went out of fashion in Europe, nobody says or puts down in writing that the, um, that the word aria refers to a race. You see, that's outdated. So you can show, yes, it was not racial, but you're just slamming an open door. Everybody has delinked the notion of Aryan from race. <clears throat> it is in 1982 that uh, K.D. Setna, the former secretary of Sri Aurobindo, came out with a book, Karpasa in Ancient India. Karpasa means cotton. And so he shows that Karpasa is absent 
in the Rig Veda, but very much present in the Harappan cities. And so he concludes that the Rig Veda is earlier than the Harappan cities. So before, let's say, 2600 BC. Mind you, for those who think that the Out of India theory is a Hindu nationalist concoction, uh, let's remark that Mr. Setana was not even a Hindu, he was a Parsi. <clears throat> but so it is his position that Sanskrit was spoken in India at least 5,000 years ago. So the standard Aryan invasion theory, which has Sanskrit come into India only at 3,500 years ago, 1500 BC, that is not possible. <clears throat> A similar conclusion was drawn uh, from the archaeological side. So to start with the Westerner, Jim Schaeffer from America in 1984 published the paper, The Aryan Invasion of India, Cultural Myth and Archaeological Reality where he contrasts the archaeological reality with the myth of the Aryan invasion. And so he shows that there is no sign of any culture entering India from Central Asia. You cannot ever follow a trace of cultural traits present in Central Asia, then later present in Afghanistan, and then finally present in India. This, um, this is said by a few Westerners. It is said by most Indians in the field of archaeology. And so I have attended several conferences of archaeologists in, in Delhi and in, in Ahmedabad. And um, I can assure you, you see, each of them came to report on his findings in all these cities, Dhola, Vira, Rakigarhi, Kali Bangan, and so on. And they all said, we don't find any trace of this invasion, whether military or peaceful. And um, even Bibi Lal, the Dean of Indian Archaeology, right now as we speak, he's 101 years old and still active. He in the 1950s was the longed for uh, archaeologist who added proof to the Aryan invasion theory. You see, he said there is an, archaeologic, an archaeological fact that fits into the Aryan invasion scenario. He was then working on the so-called painted gray ware, which was found in the, in the, the cities uh, figuring in the um, Mahabharata. And so he said that the painted gray ware, a type of pottery, is typical of the Aryans moving deeper into India. So he has rethought that. You see, when he was then young and, and trying to uh, fit in with his uh, older colleagues. And so he assumed the Aryan invasion theory and applied that to his findings, fitted his findings into the existing paradigm of an Aryan invasion. But later when he rethought his findings, and when, of course, also other findings came to light, he uh, said, well, no, this, this, this fits in the Aryan invasion scenario, but it's not at all a proof of the Aryan invasion scenario. And so he, um, he crossed the floor. He joined the Out of India camp. And so he says the um, Harappan cities uh, known to archaeologists and the Vedic literature known to philologists are two sides of the same coin. It is not that the Vedic people have replaced the Harappan people or have um, uh, subdued the uh, Harappan people uh, or have somehow uh, replaced them or imposed their culture and their language on them. Nothing of that at all. The Harappans are the Vedic people and vice versa. There was also a book at the time by Bhagwan Singh a historian who happens to be a Marxist. It's not all Hindu nationalists here. Uh, Harappa Sabhyata or Vaidik Sahitya. So uh, Harappan uh, culture and uh, Vedic literature. 
where again he has the same message. You see what we find in Harappa uh, was inhabited by the same people, some of whom composed the Vedas. Now, against this, uh, in, in debates, uh, in, in all kinds of forums, not only on social media, but also at serious conferences and so on, you often hear the claim that science has proven the Aryan invasion theory. So I already mentioned archaeology has not proven the Aryan invasion theory. On the contrary, um, Linguistics, too, on which this whole uh, debate is based, has not really proven a homeland. You see, most people who know linguistics will be very hesitant to say that it has proven any homeland. You see, they all work within the presently reigning paradigm, which situates the homeland north of the Caucasus Mountains in Ukraine and Russia, European Russia. Uh, but they haven't really proven that. You see, what would be proof in a linguistic context? Well, we'll come back to that. Um, but so at any rate, to speak of proof in, in the strong sense of the word, in the scientific sense of the word, that is very rash. Um, in the case of the archaeologists, they do not claim to have proven a homeland, but they do claim that an invasion or an immigration in India, that is not shown by the evidence at all. Now, very few of them have also done archaeology outside of India, have looked for the trail of the Indo-Europeans in Russia, in Europe, and so on. So I can't say that among Indian archaeologists, there is a wide support for the out of India theory. Um, there is some support, but you see to the extent that they care for what archeology span shows outside India. And, and so um, this is in fact in line with the attitude of very many common Hindus who um, are just not interested in what happened outside India. You see, they care for disproving the Aryan invasion. But then how these uh, European countries got Indo-Europeanized, how their branches of the Indo-European family came there, well, they don't care. And uh, so their horizon stops at the Khyber Pass in Afghanistan. And so they, they, have, they don't care really, as long as there was no Aryan invasion. And of that, the archaeologists are convinced. Recently, another line of evidence has joined, which is genetics. And here, many geneticists do claim proof. You see, there are, now, of course, there are all these videos on YouTube where you have immediate access to what is being said in those circles. And so there the word proof is rather common. And then among their followers in the media, in the Indian media especially, on social media also and so on, there you see the word proof or evidence is thrown around all the time, uh, which is uh, rather um, too hurried, too rash, um, because it, first of all, disregards the conflicts of opinion within uh, the uh, genetic field. Uh, it is said, for instance, that the, uh, a certain gene common among Indo-European speakers in Ukraine has entered India, whereas other geneticists say, no, this gene originates in India. Uh, so that conflict of opinion on which I don't want to speak out, not being a man of the, the profession. Um, but I notice that there is still a lot of debate even within the field of genetics. And secondly, and that of course I do want to speak out on, they fail to understand the uh, limited relevance of genetics to a linguistic homeland. You see, genetics measures 
at a physical type of people. But you see, these physical types of people are not tied to a particular language. In Jamaica, most people are black, but they speak English, which is an Indo-European language. So the people come from Africa, their language doesn't. And so in, in a place like Afghanistan, for example, which is a total crossroads where you constantly have migrations and invasions and occupations, you see, obviously, the population is very mixed. And so to identify a gene with a language is a bit funny. You see, myself and most people who have studied in the European uh, linguistics um, have been uh, told in their courses that the uh, 19th century fad of identifying Aryan with a physical type, that this is a total error, this total mistake. At that time, they thought, you see, Aryans are a physical type with a long skull and a long nose and a knob on the back head and, uh, and white, of course. And um, so even Max Müller at the time, when he saw the rise of this um, racist discourse and uh, racial thinking taking hold of the linguistic categories that he had developed, he insisted on saying, you see, when I say Aryan, I mean speakers of Indo-European. It has nothing to do with a skull type or a nose type or skin color. You know, to speak of uh, an Aryan language in the sense of an Aryan race speaking a language, that's the same thing as speaking of a dolicocephalic uh, accusative or, you see, any other combination of racial categories with linguistic categories. So at the time already, this was... There was already a movement against it, even when it was in vogue. After 1945, it went completely out. Uh, so we learn as a, as a historical curiosity, people used to identify language with physical type. And of course, they were wrong. You see, this was a, a childhood phase of this science, and we've long outgrown that. So it is quite surprising to see today that people in all seriousness you see doctors and scientists and so on, in all seriousness, are speaking about the Aryan gene and the Dravidian gene. This is amazing. So you see many of these geneticists who claim to have proven something, maybe they can prove that a certain physical type entered India at some point. But what language that physical type spoke, they just don't know. You see, once the, those people start writing inscriptions and, and books and so on, then you can start to know. But so far, that's not the case. Then, um, so the, the out of India theory was being revived in the 80s, 90s. And then increasingly, some Western scholars started taking interest in this new tendency. And so there was the beginning of a debate. Uh, interestingly, at the time, there was also another debate about the homeland. Namely, uh, Colin Renfrew, a British archaeologist, had thought that the homeland was in Anatolia and that the spread of an European could be identified with the spread of agriculture. Uh, now, most linguists were not convinced at all. Uh, and so by now, this theory has mostly been given up. But at any rate, in the 90s, there was this acute consciousness among Indo-Europeanists that this homeland is not certain. There is a real debate about the home. So a third contender came into the fray, which was India. So around the year 2000, there was the beginning of a debate. Edwin Bryant devoted a PhD thesis to the topic. Then later with Laurie Patton, he edited a volume about his debate in which 
representatives of the two camps uh, contributed. <clears throat> like uh, top uh, linguists like Hans Henrich Hock, uh, German working in America, or uh, Michael Witzel, same story. Uh, but also Sheikh Antalagiri, whose name we will uh, meet a few more times. Uh, the most important, I think, um, representative of the Out of India theory. And myself also have contributed. Um, the only uh, linguist, Indian linguist contributing was uh, Satya Swarup Mishra. He uh, died in the meantime. So he tried to show that the emigration from India of the gypsies that nobody doubts actually offers a number of interesting parallels to how we should imagine an earlier emigration of the Europeans themselves from India. Now, Bryant had to swallow a lot of uh, insults from the Indo-Europeanist community for his effrontery to take the out of India theory seriously. You see, while some top scholars did engage with it, even if to disagree with it, but at least they took it seriously. Maybe it's wrong, could be argued, but it's a serious theory. It's on a par with, for instance, the Anatolian theory. So others uh, were not convinced and they didn't want to hear anything of it. The same thing, by the way, has been told to me by archeologists like Jim Sheffer, who also have been uh, hounded by colleagues for daring to uh, reject the Aryan invasion theory. Similarly, when uh, Bibi Lal came out with this statement that the um, Vedic culture and the Harappan culture are really one, uh, he immediately, you know, from a trusted archaeologist who served as proof of the Aryan invasion theory, he suddenly became a Hindu nationalist. You know, sometimes this happens to people later in life, they get religion. So, you see, he became uh, a Hindu nationalist. In uh, 2005, the... Uh, leading Indologist and, and Rig Veda translator, Stephanie Jamieson, wrote a review of the volume by uh, Edwin Bryant and Laurie Patton. And so she lambasts the whole exercise of trying to organize a debate between these two camps, because you see, she compared the Out of India theory to biblical creationism, to some totally unscientific fantasy not worthy of being debated. She said that, you see, serious scholars demean themselves by engaging with it. And so that became the, uh, the attitude from then on, which was stonewalling, just acting as if the out of India theory doesn't exist. Um, oh. Yes. Okay, so now the debate is resuming. I noticed uh, on YouTube, I am myself a fairly recent user of YouTube. Apparently there are a number of lectures by me on YouTube since, since years, but I never noticed anything of it. I am a bit old school. And uh, so now that I've been looking around on this, this new medium, I notice a lot of, well, a, lot, a handful of very recent videos addressing the out of India theory. Not really addressing in the sense of arguing against it, of mustering arguments against it, but at least acknowledging that it exists and then adding that, of course, it is wrong. So they, they claim that science has proven the R innovation theory, something that I have never heard of, but okay. Um, so we'll, we'll present a few of those. So, um, 
people defending the out of India theory have always engaged with the Aryan invasion theory. They had to see the, it was all around. It was in the school books. It was on the Indian government's website. You know, when dealing with the history of India, it, it gives the Aryan invasion as a matter of course and so on. So out of India, people have had to deal with the opposing school, whereas Aryan invasion theory uh, believers uh, can easily afford to ignore the out of India theory. And in fact, quite a few have never even heard of it. Why? Because this homeland question interests Indians and people who have to deal with India because in India it still has important political consequences. Whereas in Europe it's a totally academic question. And in fact, it has it has a bad reputation because you see, dealing with origins is something 19th century. Is uh you know in the Bible they have all these genealogies or in the Puranas. And in the Middle Ages, you see people were proud. Oh, yeah, my grandfather, he fought at the, this or that battle. And therefore, I am a hero and, and so on. So the, this, this being busy with origins is something quaint, something pre-modern. And so many people feel like, you see, we don't have to deal with this. Okay, well, um, nevertheless, now people are recognizing the out of India theory. If only negative. Uh, all of these videos are by non-specialists. Uh, important to say because they always accuse the out of India camp of consisting mainly of amateurs. Or at most specialists in only one of the disciplines concerned. And, and then I mean a few are by historians. Not archaeologists, not linguists. Um, so uh, that's that's no bar. You see, that's the, I mean, those people are just as entitled to formulate an opinion about this uh, this question. But it's uh, good to keep that in mind. A few of them are very unabashed in expressing their Eurocentric sympathies and of begrudging India the honor of being the honor. Others don't, they feign or they, at least they express, I can't even say they feign, they express sympathy for India, but still they insist that Indians are wrong in believing in the out of India. So they stonewall the contents of the out of India theory as much as their uh, predecessors did, but at least they acknowledge its existence. One of these is called Think, <laughs> Think English. I don't know why that, that uh, serial title is there, but so that particular episode is called How Ancient DNA is Rewriting India's History. Uh, that's one of the videos that completely misunderstands the out of India position and why the Hindu nationalists are a bit involved with it in the sense that they support the out of India. Thing. So it brings in the caste system all the time. That's what very many Westerners do. You see, when they think Hinduism, they think caste system, which largely explains the uh, contempt or hatred that many Westerners have for Hinduism. Even though it has never done them any wrong, they associate Hinduism with caste system, which in turn they interpret as a type of racial apartheid system, type of racial slavery, and so uh, something to be fought against. Uh, so that uh, in that video, um, uh, there is a very garbled explanation of why Hindu nationalists have anything to do with the out of India theory. They identify as higher caste Aryans. They claim that the Harappans were higher caste Aryans. But in fact, you see, the Aryans are from the north. And he treats that as proven, as a given. Um, and yet, you see, this, this out of India scenario is used by right wing nationalists. Now, what the out of India theory specifically says is not really explained. 
any arguments, any authoritative names in the Out of India camp are not mentioned at all. So this is simply uh, explaining the, the Aryan invasion theory and then a few jibes uh, against the Out of India theory. Then we have another one uh, in the series, Historia Maxima, and that is called Who Were They? The Aryan Migration to India. It admits that there exists little evidence, but it also says that we'll say what is known. You know, known, not what is theorized, what is thought up, what is speculated. No, no, what is known, as if there is evidence. And so we definitely know the Aryas came from the north. Well, no, you don't know that at all. That's precisely what is to be proven. If you have two theories, then you ought to look at what both theories say, and then you have to find proof, and that proof will you know, happen to point to the one theory or the other, or maybe at a third one. So you see in this video again, the out of India theory is dismissed in one sentence. Interestingly, uh, for what is other than evidence, uh, this video starts with a quote praising the Aryans and then revealing at the end that the author of the quote is Adolf Hitler. Aha! So that's uh, that's where he wants to get the Hindu nationalists in the corner hmm. of Adolf Hitler. And so it is then said, and clearly this man is speaking about the Aryas. And then you see the focus shifts to India, to Brahmins and so on. Well, no, this man is clearly not speaking about Aryas. Arya is here given in the Sanskrit form. Arya, not Aryan. Uh, and so that means something totally different. By the time of Hitler, the word Aryan had come into use in Europe as a racial term, which originally it wasn't. Originally, it simply meant Indo-European. Uh, but so by the 18, by 1860 thereabouts, it started acquiring a racial meaning. So by the time of Hitler, this was an accomplished fact. He didn't know any other meaning than the racial one. And so when he spoke about Indians, it was always very negative. He really uh, looked down on this country. He said very explicitly, uh, on the basis of the Aryan invasion theory, of course, that the Indians are a, a mixed race. They're a very unfortunate. You see the superior Aryans went in there. And then unfortunately, they, you know, they uh, mixed their blood with that of the natives. And so they became inferior. Fortunately for them, the white British Aryans came to save them, to give them good governance, which they themselves are incapable of, and so on. That was Hitler's view of India. And so this man, when he praises the Aryans, he is definitely not speaking about the brown Aryans. In fact, there is a poem by Rudyard Kipling in which he uses the word Arya in the sense of Hindu. And so there he speaks of Aryan brown. <laughs> so typical for the Aryas is that they are brown colored, brown skinned. So they are not the Aryans that Hitler is talking. But you see here, this word Arya is very convenient to blur issues and to demonize the, uh, the Hindu position. It describes a violent invasion, which is the, the classical uh, the classical theory. Um, so it um, it uh, says, for example, that the natives were African-like, were dark, and that they are anasa. You see, that's a, that's a 19th century etymology from a word anasa. Anasa means noseless. Flat nose, a bit like you see, some Africans have a flat nose. Uh, whereas, in fact, it comes from uh, uh, from an asa without mouth, 
which means garbled of speech, incomprehensible. Or it, um, it um, uh, gives an etymology of the enemy named Dasa. So it, it picks from the Rig Veda a battle where the enemies are called Dasas. And so it deduces this word from a root das, which means waste. Mm -hmm. And so there, of course, it brings in the whole caste system that the lower castes are deemed dirty and so on. Um, so this is the absolutely classical form of the um, Aryan invasion theory. We will next see a few more sophisticated forms. Then there is a... Um, a video by uh, Survive the Jive, uh, which is a um, sort of neo-pagan but Euro-nationalist uh, channel. And that's um, by a historian called Thomas Rausel. And um, so this, this particular episode is called Aryan Invasion of India, Myth or Reality. So this title explicitly says here we want to uh, uh, show to be myth the alternative to the Aryan invasion theory. So we're going to show that the Aryan invasion theory is real and the out of India scenario is a myth. Uh, again, you see there is nothing in the video at all about the out of India theory. What they say, what arguments they use, you will not learn it in this video. It simply restates the Aryan invasion theory. Uh, it also says it has heard that um, people in the out of India camp, and I suppose I get counted as that, um, have uh, associated the Aryan invasion theory with not only British colonialism, not only with the Christian missionaries in India, not only with the Dravidianist movement, the Dalit movement, and so on but especially with national socialism. And so in, in national socialist Germany, of course, the school books taught the Aryan invasion theory. And, and this was really the, the great illustration of the worldview of the Nazis. Namely, you have a superior white people who are very dynamic, therefore they invade the country of the indolent dark natives, and then they institute a racial apartheid system to keep their race pure, uh, which is the caste system. Uh, but then unfortunately, they did a lot of mixing anyway, so they became inferior. And then fortunately, the pure Aryans from Britain have come to rule over. Um, so for, for Nazism, this was a godsend, the, the Aryan invasion team. Now, this uh, Thomas Rausel uh, claims that Hermann Günther, who was one of the scholars in Nazi Germany who really espoused national socialism, that he located the homeland in Asia. Well, actually, uh, Hermann Günther located the homeland in the steppe landscape, which stretches from U Ukraine, Russia, to Kazakhstan, all the way to Mongolia. So. Yeah, you see, that could include uh, that part of Asia, but that's still outside of India. That's still the Aryan invasion theory. If the homeland is outside of India, then Sanskrit cannot have come to India except by invading it. Um, so even if we generously allow this Asian uh, extension to Hermann Günther's theory, it's still the Aryan invasion theory that he espouses. So this is a faint attempt to foist Nazi associations, uh, which belong with the Aryan invasion theory, onto the out of India theory. Then there is a series called World of Antiquity, which has a sub-series Myths of Ancient History, where a Dr. David Miano uh, attacks uh, pro out of India videos by David Frawley and by Avijit Chauda. 
They are called, did civilization begin in India? And when did Sanskrit migrate to India? Um, it, of course, emphasizes that both of them are not uh, professional historians or something similar. <clears throat> this, is, this is a classic, uh, you know, <clears throat> that David Frawley has done enormous work on uh, Sanskrit or on Ayurveda. That's usually not mentioned. He has also done astrology. So they always say, the astrologer David Frawley. Or, for instance, about Sri Kantalagiri, uh, who is a self-taught historian, but who made his living as a bank clerk. So they always emphasize the bank clerk Sri Talagiri, as opposed to the Sanskrit scholar Michael Wilson. And so about Abhijit Chauda, of course, he is a very legitimate scientist, but in another field. So he's a theoretical physicist. So... Um, so it is said in this video, the out of India theory is invented by amateurs. Well, um, first of all, I am very much a man of the field. Uh, and there are a few others, uh, like uh, the Greek Sanskrit professor, uh, Nikolas Kazanas. Um, but at any rate, even if today, the um, out of India theory is being defended by a number of non-professionals. That's not where the out of India theory started. The out of India theory started in the 18th century. And so the, you know, the people back then might not uh, be taken serious today because science has evolved a lot. But in their day, they were the top scientists. You know, they were very much taken seriously. And um, so up to about 1840, the out of India theory was simply the done thing. And the Aryan invasion theory was a novelty. Uh, so it's not invented by amateurs. It's not even invented by Indians. It was very much a European invention. Though, you see, the India versus Europe does play a role in a fairly innocent sense. You see, I mean, Indians are going to say, yeah, but it's racism and it's colonialism and so on. I don't deny that there was plenty of racism back then. And, of course, I don't deny the fact of colonialism. However, these two are not the reason why the out of India, uh, the, sorry, the out of India theory was abandoned and the Aryan invasion theory was adopted. This was for a few scholarly reasons that again, with hindsight, we can frown upon. We can find not, not very logical, but okay, at that time they were convincing enough among serious scholars. Um, so the innocent circumstance that I'm referring to is one that you may notice when you see that the last defenders of the out of India theory were people all living in India. You see, the, the, first of all, the, the, the whole notion of, uh, of an Indo-European language family uh, starts in India with the Jesuit missionary uh, Gaston Laurent Cardou and with the uh, um, uh, out of India, uh, the, the, the East India Company judge William Jones. Then later it is defended by uh, this uh, Curzon, by this uh, Mount Stuart Elphinstone, who live in India. Um, and so they realize the magnitude of India, not only the enormous size and number of people, you know, easily half of the Indo-European uh, speaking population in the world at that time lived in India, uh, meaning the Indian subcontinent. Um, and so for them, it is difficult to discard India just like that. Whereas for Europeans who know India only from maps and maps with the Mercator projection which does injustice to countries close to the equator. 
would depict Scandinavia as much larger than India, whereas India is as big as or even bigger than Europe as a whole. Okay, so this their notion of India is is some some little country in the distance. You see, totally on on the side on an extreme uh, region of the Indo-European expanse. So for them, it is easier to ignore India and to 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 withdraw India from the whole scenario that they're thinking of about the spread of Indo-European. Okay, but so at any rate. Those people, you see, Europeans totally, um, totally aware of the latest um, findings in science in Europe at that time, they still defended the out of India scenario. All right, now um, let's move on. Uh, yeah, an important point here, apart from um, the uh, the actual argumentation is the word Aryan invasion theory. You see, in this video, they make a lot of that question. You know, they claim that it should not be invasion, it should be called immigration. Okay, you see, for our abbreviation AIT, that makes no difference. The I can be for invasion or immigration. And um, frankly, I don't mind the word immigration. Um, but it really makes no difference. Uh, you see, both immigration and invasion mean that the homeland was outside of India and they had to come into India. So, you see, sometimes I hear people in this debate, you see, Indians uh, say, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, they don't believe in any invasion anymore. No, no, now they say it's an immigration. And then they think they've said something very profound. Whereas to the stakes of the debate, this makes no difference at all. You see, both immigration and invasion mean that the homeland is outside of India. And so an invasion is also a form of immigration. So that, that term immigration is fine with me. However, I do think that the people who speak of an invasion have a point. First of all, of course, it has uh, a historical justification. You see, all the Europeans who thought up the invasion theory thought in terms of a military conflict. Why do they speak English in America? Because America has militarily been conquered. Uh, or Spanish in South America and so on. Uh, English in Australia and so on. This has been taken over. Um, now, there was no trace archaeologically of a military invasion. There's no sign of any battle fought or so. Um, so it was a wise retreat, you see, to start to think up some more peaceful scenario. They had to, because it was just too flagrant, too blatant, uh, that there was simply no uh no uh, evidence for this invasion at all uh so the indo-europeans somehow came into india under the radar without leaving a trace okay you see these things exist if today in france there are millions of uh algerians and moroccans and tunisians north africans it is not because there has been a conquest of France by North Africans. They have peacefully immigrated. And um, in fact, the uh, French ex president, Valéry Giscard d'Estaing, he was, you know, in his old age uh, giving an interview and he was worrying about his evolution. He thought that there were too many North Africans coming in. Now, what did he say? He said, this is an invasion. What did he mean by that? Not that the North Africans had literally invaded France in the sense of militarily conquered it. No. What he meant was, they are doing what invaders do and not what immigrants do. 
immigrants adapt to the country that they set in. They take over the language and the lifestyle and so on. Whereas invaders impose their own ways on the natives and at any rate retain their own ways. And so North Africans retain their Islam, retain much of their clothing and so on, their language. Um, so in his opinion, and I'm not speaking out on the truth of that opinion, but in his opinion, that constitutes an invasion, a peaceful immigration, which does not have the effect of an assimilation of the immigrants to the native existing culture. So if the native culture has to change in order to accommodate the newcomers, that, in his usage of the term, is no longer an immigration, an invasion. Now, what happens in the case of India? You see, the Aryan immigrants or invaders, or what you call them, have at any rate, and far more thoroughly than the North Africans in France, changed the Indian society. They have imposed their language, they have imposed their religion to the extent that the native population, though far larger, far more sophisticated, has completely forgotten its own language. You see, when you look later in Indian history, you never see this happen. You see the, um, the Greeks, the, the, the Scythians, the, the Huns, the, 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 the Kushanas, the Turks, they have all invaded India, leaving their Central Asian genes in the Indian population. And yet, they have all lost their language. They have all assimilated into Indian language. Uh, so that's, that's in fact a point that the Aryan invasionists ought to prove. You see, how is this possible that such a large country can be linguistically transformed by a population that doesn't even take control of the country. Okay, well, um, so I stand by the word invasion. In fact, there, um, some of the scholars have, have also um, lambasted this new fad of insisting on the word uh, immigration, uh, because you see, it's very squeamish. It's like, oh, you see military, you know, that's that's like, you know, that's so masculine, that's no longer politically correct, that's toxic. Uh, we have to find something more, uh, more hippie. Uh, so it's a peaceful immigration. Well, so uh, some scholars have also lambasted that. It's not true that there is a consensus against the word invasion. But okay, I admit, it is now more fashionable, usually, to speak about immigration. It's also more in keeping with the archaeological evidence, which shows no sign of a military invasion. But scratch an, an immigrationist, and very often you will still find an invasionist. Like, for example, I remember some online uh, discussion with uh, Professor Witzel, where he says, okay, you see, the Aryans, when they came into India, they brought the horse and, 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 and chariot. This was the, the panzer. The tank, you know, this gave them military superiority. So ultimately, yes, it's a military invasion. Or look at the translations of the Rig Veda. A number of battles are, are described there. And so in the translation, they say, oh, this is a battle against the natives. This is the Aryans against the natives. So, yeah, there is a military aspect to it. Um, but all right, okay, let's 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 put that between brackets and go with the word immigration. Now, the thing is that the archaeologists archaeologists who have not found traces of a military invasion have also not found traces of an immigration. There is no trail of Central Asian cultural traits that goes through Bactria Margiana that goes through the Khyber Pass and then enters India and changes India. There is no such thing. So again, you see, even without the word invasion, you are not served well by the archaeologists. Instead, what they have shown is the enormous expansion of the Harappan culture. You see, the, the Harappans were very at home um, in Oman 
along the Gulf, in Mesopotamia, in uh, Afghanistan, everywhere you find settlements or at any rate produce from Harappa. And so to them, you see, Central Asia was their, their backyard. So it's very easy for them to enter that backyard, to expound into that backyard, even without an actual emigration. Um, so, okay, so, so, you know, that much for the discussion of the word invasion. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's, you know, it distracts attention from the real argument. Then he blames um, uh, Abhijit Chauda for not laying out in detail what his opponents say. Now, that is precisely what is wrong with his own camp. The Aryan invasion camp has never laid out in detail, nor has he done so in this video, what the opposing camp actually says. You see, in a debate among scholars, you try to get the best version of the opponent's position. And you try to refute that best version. Because then certainly the weaker versions also stand refuted. By contrast, if you have a, a politician's debate on TV, they will always try to, you see, lambast the other side, to ridicule the other side, to pick the weakest point in the opponent's position and focus on that one. So that's what the Aryan invasion people, including these video makers, systematically do with the Out of India thing. Like, for example, uh, Chauda says somewhere that the, um, the people in, in Ukraine, you know, of which they have dug up a number of skeletons and then artists have sort of remade what they must have looked like, these people look like Indians. Well, you see, that's a very weak statement to make. You need not have done that. We don't know exactly what they were like. We know they were relatively tall, taller than the native Europeans at that time. Um, and uh, they, I don't think they were very typically Indian because what you get in the out of India scenario is that uh, they people uh, Central Asia and transform the population there, spread their language, which has a lot of prestige behind it. And then it is this mixed population, this largely Central Asian population that then invades Europe. You can compare it, for example, to the uh, Muslim invasion of India. The Arabs converted the Turks, and then it is the Turks who invade India, not the Arabs. And so similarly, it is not the Indians who invade Europe. It is the Indo-Europeanized populations of Central Asia and, and Eastern Europe who then invade the rest of Europe. Um, or for example, uh, there is this title, Did Civilization Begin in India? Uh, apparently David Frawley had said something to that effect. Uh, again, you see, that's a weak point that is not at all implied in the out of India theory. Uh, if the Egyptians, for example, practice sun worship, just like the Indians, it's not because they had to take it over from India. You see, they, they see the sun rise every day. And so, you know, or Atawalpa, the Inca, he also was a sun worshiper. He didn't get it from India. Um, so, you see, civilization has many sources, and yes, India is an important one, but not the only one, so I wouldn't make that, uh, that claim. Uh, okay, it also says that the Aryan invasion theory is accepted by all scholars. This is flatly untrue. I already mentioned the Indian archaeologists. A few archaeologists from the West, a few philologists from the West, uh, a number of geneticists, of course. You see, geneticists from the West usually accept the Aryan invasion theory, though that is not their field. A large part of their belief in the Aryan invasion comes from what their colleagues, philologists, have told them. Because in their field, the Aryan invasion is, is the, the accepted paradigm at the moment. And so the geneticists start thinking within that paradigm. In the very first genetic studies, like by this uh, bomb shot, you can see very explicitly, they themselves write it, you see, 
that their findings fit into a theory that our colleagues from the humanities department say happened in the spread of the European. Um, and so that still plays a lot. Um, so um, anyway, so, you know, in gen geneticists often make a conclusion that is not entirely based on the data they find, but some geneticists also draw totally different conclusions from the data, find different data, and say that, no, it is India that is the homeland. So you see, accepted by all scholars is total bluff. Um, then uh, there's also the false claim that scientists have proven that the tribals are the oldest population of India. We don't know if that's a very common stereotype that the tribals are primitive, that there's some kind of cavemen and so on. Uh, they're quite capable of moving, like there are a number of tribals of which it is known that they came from Southeast Asia, like the Nagas in India's Northeast came from Southeast Asia only a thousand years ago. Then the, um, the Munda speaking tribals. Uh, belong to a language family that has its point of gravity in Southeast Asia. The largest branch of that language family is Vietnamese. So they may have originated in India and then become big in Vietnam, but they may also have originated in Vietnam and then come to India. Anyway, so, you know, these, these are, again, all these, you see, uh, points that fit into the, uh, the battle formation against the out of India theory, but that are shaky. Um, this uh, video admits that this famous Aryan gene, R1A1, uh, has a greater diversity in India. This has been shown in a paper. Um, and so that's an indicator that India is the land of origin. Here for genes, the same counts as for language. In the area of origin, you will have a greater diversity. Um, however, he tries to explain that away, you see, in this paper, but this is by Hindu scholars, maybe that's suspect, but so they conclude, yes, you see, the origin of R1A1 is India. And uh, they also do so for another reason, namely that they simply find more ancient samples in India. Uh, but um, he explains that away, saying, oh yeah, but it's because of the enormous population density of India, that you do get more variation and so on is dubious anyway it's a debate among geneticists you see i only take a, a ringside view but i mean I, I can't decide these matters myself but one thing really made me smile it was said that the average of admixture for indo-europeans in the population is 72 generations and for dravidians 108 generations uh, i don't know what that is based on but at any rate to make indo-europeans into a genetic category or to make dravidians into a genetically identifiable category now that's that's a farce next um, then there is uh, another serious uh, video, Mythic Concepts, Indian Origins. So that's in a series called Mythic Concepts uh, that uh, starts out very uh, friendly, very positively for India. Namely, it focuses on the depictions of yogis in uh, Harappa. And so there are, you know, this is the famous... Uh, Shiva Pashupati, you know, sitting in lotus posture and surrounded by animals. There are a number of others, there are more than you think, uh, of such seals where somebody's sitting in yoga posture. Uh, he also shows a detail that somehow I had never noticed, that many of those are depicted with an ashwata or peepal tree uh, growing from their skull. Uh, it's interesting symbolism. Um, and perhaps related to uh, symbolism about world trees that you find uh, in Germanic mythology and so on. Uh, though, of course, that would presuppose that the Harappans were Indo-European. That, that is precisely what is, what is combated here. Uh, anyway, so uh, 
the attitude towards Indian culture is quite positive. And and he's quite interesting, you see. So he he charts territory that most Hindus have never done, uh, namely the, the the factor of uh, ancient the ancient roots of yoga. I mean, when when you hear about yoga, mostly people speak about the the Yoga Sutra by Patanjali or so, which is pretty late. You see, yoga is here five thousand years old. Um, then. The video, unfortunately, takes the Aryan invasion theory for granted again. Uh, there's no Purva Paksha, as they call it. Uh, Purva Paksha means the the earlier wing. That is to say, if you enter a debate, you have the, the wing of the opponent. You see, the case that the opponent is making, you have to reformulate that case, both in, in Sanskritic and Tibetan debating traditions, but also in medieval scholasticism in Europe, you had to first reformulate the position of the opponent. And then when the opponent agreed, yes, this is my position, then you could attack that position. Now here, this is totally absent. There is no case at all, not here in these videos, not anywhere else that I know of, where an Aryan invasion defender is uh, uh, showing that he knows that he understands the out of India position. Then uh, there, are, there are quite a few political innuendos. These are all vicarious. He doesn't know what he's talking about, clearly. These are all parroted from what people like uh, my friend Michael Witzel uh, have, have said or written. Um, so he misunderstands the politics of it completely. When the out of India theory reigned before 1850, it was not political and it had no political effects in India. When the Aryan invasion theory won out, it became political immediately. The British immediately started using it for justifying their colonization of India. The missionaries immediately started using it for pitting the lower castes against the higher castes and bringing them into their own sphere of influence. Soon, Dravidian chauvinism arose. And then, you know, after that, national socialism came about. Then in India, till today, there are still some political movements that base themselves on the, the Aryan invasion. So it's normal, it's commendable to counter this. If you are against politics impinging on scholarship, well, then you should absolutely oppose the Aryan invasion theory. Uh, then um, in this video also, there is often uh, an impression that the out of India theory in India, you know, identified with Hindu nationalism, is somehow continuous with the old Aryan invasion theory, that it somehow also glorifies the Aryans, whereas there's no notion of Aryans in the out of India position. Um, okay, so of course it claims that the out of India theory is debunked. Though it can't say anything about what arguments would have debunked it. No argument at all. And it gives currently as a fact the Rig Veda was composed on the steps to the north. Um, then finally it says, uh, just uh, you know, to sum up uh, non-controversially, that everyone is an immigrant, implying that the out of India theory uh, starts from the fantasy of a culturally pure India. No, that's not the case. You see, of course, the Aryans did not even populate all of India. India was already diverse with the Aryans inside India. And the fact that everyone is an immigrant, that precisely uh, should be told to the uh, Aryan invasion camp. Uh, Malikarjuna Kharge, a Congress politician said in parliament in 2015, you pointing out at some uh, government politicians from North India, uh, uh, you Aryans, you don't belong in India. You see, even if the Aryan invasion theory were true, that would mean that their ancestors had been in India for about 3,500 years. Are you still an immigrant after 3,500 years? So I think in this case, the out of India theory happens to be on the side of sanity.
I think we need to go a little faster, otherwise we'll have to split it into two episodes. Okay. Uh, so here we go. Uh, linguistics. Uh, well, yes, as I said, you see, in linguistics, not much is proven. Uh, what is proven is that there exists an Indo-European language family. Now, this is pretty banal, uh, pretty ordinary to say, but it has to be said in this context because very many Hindus doubt the existence of an Indo-European language family. They don't want to believe that Sanskrit is more akin to a foreign language like Latin than with an Indian language like Tamil. Yet that's what we say. That's what the facts say. Um, okay. Uh, then uh, mega comparatism could help a little. So there is not much in linguistics that really can pinpoint the homeland. But there is one thing, namely, if you can show that there has been an interaction between Proto-Indo-European, not any of its daughter languages, not Sanskrit, but Proto-Indo-European and some other language of which we can guess uh, the homeland at that time. Now, there is no such thing in Europe. There is no native European language alive today. Even Basque, which was in Europe maybe 10,000 years, has immigrated. And any native European language like Tartessian, uh, Ligurian, uh, Etruscan, and so on, have all disappeared. Um, then in South India, no luck. You see, Dravidian or uh, Munda are not visibly related to Indo-Europe. However, and, and there is an exchange of words between Dravidian and Sanskrit, but only at a later stage, not at the Proto-Indo-European stage. However, there's a Russian scholar, Igor Tonoyan Belyayev, from St. Petersburg, where there happens to be a, a Tibetan temple since 1913, I think. He knows Tibetan, and he says a number of Tibetan words clearly are taken from or have been borrowed by Proto-Indo-European. So I'll give just one example. Again, you see, I, I hardly know Tibetan, certainly not enough for this, uh, this reasoning. Uh, but so I'll give an example of where this is going. There's a word pugs in Tibetan. I don't know if it's pronounced today, but it's written and therefore also pronounced 1500 years ago as pugs. That is related to an Indo-European word peku, which means cattle and which you find exactly as it was in Latin, in the Latin form, pecus. That also has a Sanskrit cognate, but that has evolved. That is the word pashu, which means animal. Now, it's not the word pashu that is related to Tibetan pukes. It is the original Proto-Indo-European form, pecus, that is related to pukes. And so he gives another handful of examples. Uh, so it's not enough yet for me to say, oh, this, this is the final proof, but it's that type of proof that we need. And so in this case, it po points to uh, a homeland bordering Tibet. And so, well, there you have the out of India theory. Um, linguistic, well, we'll skip that. Um, but so the main point is that they don't know the out of India theory at all. Yet, you see, this is easy to find. Now you also have, since we're talking about YouTube, you have these videos where Sri Kantalageri explains the out of India scenario in quite some detail. You can look that up. You can, of course, if you want to know all the, the chapter and verse from the Vedas and so on, then you buy his books, but they're available. And um, so, so, you see, there is this total ignorance um, part of it is fairly innocent in the sense that it's only very recently that this out of India theory has come, you know, within their horizon. It's also a personal thing. Many have published papers which presuppose the Aryan invasion theory. Like, for instance, they have written on philosophy and they say, Barhadara Yakupanishad is from 6th century BC. 
Now, how do you know that? You see, nothing in the text gives that chronology. And so that chronology was devised after agreeing on the Aryan invasion theory. If there was an Aryan invasion in 1500 BC, then the Vedas are 1200 BC, blah, 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 and the Upanishads 800 to 600 or so BC. And so if you suddenly throw this whole field open and the chronology can be doubted and the Vedas were much earlier and so on, then their chronology of the Upanishads becomes yellowed, you know, becomes obsolete. Uh, so they don't like to change all these things. You know, that's mostly what it is. Uh, then, of course, there is the association with Hindu nationalism, which has been demonized no end. Um, so they, um, they ought to get to know the, um, the work of the linguistic work of Nicolas Casanas, the archaeological and genetic work of Michel Danino, a uh, French-born naturalized Indian, and especially of the, um, the historical literary uh, work of Sri Kantalageri which really uh, shows that the Rig Veda is much older than the, uh, the Aryan invasion allows for, um, which in incidentally was also said by some European scholars. When Max Müller came with his chronology, Aryan invasion in 1500 BC, his own pupil Moritz Winternitz argued, but this is impossible. You can't cram this enormous evolution from Rig Veda to, let's say, the Buddha, into just a few hundred years. Um, so there are other reasons also for postulating a, a higher uh, chronology. Um, then uh, he adopts entirely um, true to form, not eccentrically, uh, the um, theory of Hermann Oldenberg that sees a layeredness in the Rig Veda and that distinguishes between old books middle books, new books, which allows for uh, discerning a gradient, an evolution within the Vedic period, where you can see, for example, a geographical gradient, where in the oldest books they know about the Ganga. They come from the east. They settle in, in the Saraswati Basin. Then they go to the west, the rivers of West Punjab, then the Indus, then finally Afghanistan. They do exactly the opposite of what the Aryan invasion described. Finally, there is the evidence of uh, astrochronology. There are a number of astronomical data in the Vedic literature that give a rather precise date, rather a few centuries more or less, but certainly a much higher chronology than you find, uh, than, than you can reconcile with the um, the Aryan invasion theory. Like there is a book that all Indologists have read in their student days, The Vedic Index by Keith and MacDonald. It does admit that there are some Vedic passages that point to a date of 2200 BC. And then they say that somehow this refers to events in 800 BC. You see, just moving up 1,400 years like it's nothing. Um, and so there's later work like that. Pingri, for example, is criticized by people who know Hindu astrology that he's, you know, artificially uh, brings the chronology uh, down. So you see, this is real hard scientific evidence and it militates against the Aryan invasion scenario. So these um, videos exploit the weaknesses of Hindus so that they can focus on those rather than on the real out of India argument. Uh, for Hindus, it won't do to just smugly brush it off and say, oh yeah, we don't need these foreigners. Um, you see, they are established, you know, it's like on a battlefield, they are up on a hill, you have to fight uphill. So you can't afford the luxury of ignoring them. You have to take them seriously. And so you have to equip yourself with the real facts. You see, most Hindus don't know much about the whole debate. Now with genetics coming in, you see, they are good at the hard sciences. 
we've all studied engineering or so. And so this comes in handy. On linguistics, they know nothing. But on, on, on genetics, they have done very well to counter the belief that now exists in the West that genetics has proven the RNA invasion theory. But still, you see, they, they ought to get better informed about you know this whole debate. Um, then you have to leave out this tendency to flatter yourself by bringing in claims like India was the origin of civilization. Just drop it. And finally, don't disparage the other camp. Maybe I've done so myself. Apologies in that case. You see, it's impolite and therefore counterproductive. People are not going to listen to you if they think that you are uh, spreading hate against them. If you call them racist, colonialist, and so on. Uh, it is also untrue. You see, I know that in the 19th century there were racists who theorized the Aryan invasion. But today you won't find that. Um, you know, this, this is a page that has been turned completely. So you have to stop fighting the battles of the past. It's also irrelevant. You see, people may be motivated by racism, by colonialism, or by anything else. You see, even if they have wrong motives, they may still be speaking the truth. So, um, so drop that, you see. Get serious about the Aryan invasion versus out of India polemic. The solution is really around the corners. In a few years, if we, if we, uh, conduct ourselves well, this debate may be over. That's, in fact, what uh, I'm going for. Thank you. That's a wonderful... <clears throat> That's a wonderful explanation, uh, Dr. Elst, that uh, there's every likelihood that uh, we are going to win the debate. Uh, but, of course, we are going to get play our cards right. So thank you very much. I think it was a very enlightening session. And uh, I'm sure our audience will benefit uh, uh, much by this and will also sharpen their own arguments in this particular matter. <coughs> so thank you. <coughs>